Right. Today, um, I will speak about the question of remembering um, in a modern context. Perhaps some of you are aware that um, in Germany, uh, the tradition is uh, very good in terms of remembering. Um, I come myself from uh, an experience of uh, the Shoah. My father was a survivor and my mother uh, a refugee um, because of their Jewish backgrounds. And so you have a situation of um, a Holocaust memorial right in front of the German parliament to remind uh, German parliamentarians of their responsibility and what has happened uh, or what has been decided out of that place. Today I will not speak about that, but I will speak about something that emerged uh, in, in a sort of more published form with an article, a, a column, the main column commentary in the German Jewish newspaper. They called it Stop Olympic Village. Uh, Munich discusses a memorial site for the um, victims of the 1972 terrorist act uh, of, uh, and th th those victims was uh, part of the Olympic mission um, and team um, uh, from Israel in, in 1972. I grew up in the Olympic Village and I will tell you a little bit how that came to be as we go along. My intention is uh, that I will um, summarize the most important things about what happened in 1972 so you're up to scratch with that and I will add to it uh, on request also from uh, James uh, who very kindly invited me and I'm very grateful for, for, for his invitation and for you to, to be here. Um, I, will, I will put in the, the personal anecdotes because I think that is uh, quite interesting how somebody who is both from a Jewish Holocaust background um, and has lived all, most of his li young, young life in the Olympic Village, how, how that affected me and, ho and how this correlates to the question of memorialization. Um, there's an English version of the article I should quickly tell you on my blog um, and so you can, you can uh, access it there. This slide which I kept open at the beginning sort of is a very good introduction to the main questions. 1936 was the year when Olympics, the Olympic Games were held in Berlin. It was a, a, a public stage for the Third Reich and most crucially uh, some of the Jewish athletes were excluded uh, from those games. Uh, when it came, when Germany had the next opportunity to uh, stage uh, the Olympic Games, they wanted to do it very differently. Um, one of the things that they wanted to do different is not use the color red. Um, because red was associated with the Third Reich. Other things they wanted to do um, is to have um, an Olympic area that is very playful, that is open. The architect Günther Benisch, who became very famous because of that uh, project, wanted to create a democratic structure of egalitarian access. And so that, that's what, if you ever go to Munich, you can see that. It, it, one of the things is the loads of little winded streets, no, no streets to parade in, yeah? but streets to hide in, to have a little um, day out. And the Olympic Park has become, since 1972, a very unique recreation space. This is a, an image from the Olympic Village which was built and constructed according to the same uh, ideas. It's very crucial that it, the playfulness of it and that uh, there are lo loads of different spaces in the Olympic Village where one can congregate and meet. Uh, it's, it's got a school right from, from the beginning of the design. It's got an ecumenical uh, church center and 
the Germans really wanted to use that opportunity to show that they were serious about um, equality and democracy and, and freedom. There's just another example. There are loads of these little wells and fountains uh, all through the village. And beside that, the village is also, I should say, it's built on a bridge. So all the flats um, are built on a bridge. That means that the whole zone is scar-free. So it's a really unique experience of living. Yeah, that's another image. This lake is very much adjacent almost to the place that I'm going to talk about. This is called the uh, Nadi Street. This is uh, one of the middle streets, and the streets where the um, Israeli Olympic team would have lived was here. And there are scenes, um, documentary scenes from uh, 1972, which shows the hostage crisis happening and athletes here relaxing in that lake. Uh, just one of those strange contradictions. So, this is another summary. These are student flats, by the way. I should actually mention this, that most, the majority of the apartments in the rear in the Olympic Village were um, on offer for purchase just prior to the Olympics. Um, and the, the, the small units here have become available for students, and they're, they're given out by, by the municipal city of, um, you know, on, on application. My father and my mother decided that they wanted to go and live there uh, in 19, nine, 1971, 1972, when this was still just being constructed. And I think that for, particularly for my father, who had lived experience of, um, of the Holocaust and is actually from Poland, this offered an opportunity of a modern place, of a place that was disassociated with the ger old German past. The streets here did not have a history that was burned with the blood of Jews. It was celebrating internationalism, it had the Olympics as a promise, and my father said, that's, that's great, I'm gonna, uh, that's where I want to live, and purchased an apartment in the village. Um, I think before, before uh, the Olympic Games, you had to make that commitment. The, the Games had, um, I had another translation, so another translation of this, sometimes it's called the Carefree Games, or the, I, I said it's the, uh, translated as the Happy Games, but that was to be the theme. Um, there you can see the opening, and then the 5th of September. Eight armed fighters of the Palestinian Black September movement entered the village um, and straight away went for the uh, area where the Israelis were, were living and uh, in the hustle and bustle, two athletes uh, immediately, well, within, within uh, a certain time frame came to find their death. They eventually managed to get uh, 11 hostages, and the demand was 234 jailed Palestinians and non-Arabs from uh, the state of Israel, uh, plus um, some uh, German um, uh, left-wing terrorists, which is, by the way, I should say a little word about that. These people, um, um, Ulrike Meinhof and uh, Andreas Bader at that time have killed about 40 people already. Um, and there was a manhunt to, to catch them, and, and they just uh, were arrested. But prior to that, we now know from secret files, um, the uh, Black September movement had negotiated uh, and sought assistance from uh, prominent German neo-Nazis. So the affiliations uh, here were, were they, they, didn't re they were just looking for people who uh, some sort of, uh, anti, you know, against, against the state and uh, whether you work with the right or with the left doesn't seem to have mattered much, although presumably um, I know that the Red Army faction saw Israel as a problem at the time and neo-Nazis see Jews as a problem. So I think that in that sense um, um, they were on the same lines. This image, 
is very important to me. Um, this is one of the hostage takers um, looking down from one of the balconies uh, in the Olympic Village. And um, I took uh, a year of um, uh, psychotherapy about my father's experiences. And the therapist asked me, what is the first exp uh, experience you remember from your childhood? This is one of the first things that I remember. And I can only guess that it's because the television was on the whole day on the 5th of September. Fatally on. And I'll tell you in a moment why. Um, and so I must have somehow been at home and, and picked that up. Always the camera is going in and, and looking at that. Fatally life, because there was an attempt to rescue and liberate the hostages. Unfortunately, there was, they didn't, the security services didn't speak to uh, the media team, and so it was live on television, the rescue attempt, and guess who saw it? The terrorists themselves inside the building. So this is right down where the hostages are, and that was on television, and that was one of the blasters. So the, there were inadequacies of, of the village. Some of them, so there was no armed security. This relates right back to 1936. Germany did not want to be seen, uh, or did not want to show policemen in uniform. They, they felt it was important that Germany was seen as a pacifist Germany, and that's why 300 um, police officers were on site, but they didn't have arms and they didn't wear uniforms. Um, there, were, there was a forensic uh, security assessment made, believe it or not, and one of the scenarios um, was that a Palestinian or left-wing terrorism group could possibly use the games to their own advantage, and there was uh, no action taken on this. Um, there was, once the, once the um, event happened, there was a rejection of outside help, not only from an offer that uh, Israel made to send some of their people, but there was also disagreement who would be responsible. I don't know if you know the German federal system, but Bavaria is one of the states in Germany that is very strong and proud of its federal uh, situation. So they, for example, have their own federal police officers, whilst in the rest of Germany you have uh, a different police force responsible for security. So there was huge um, confusion. Germany was not ready for this sort of uh, uh, problem. Um, there was also an inability to assess the number of terrorists, and that was very uh, difficult later. And there's the TKB camera point, and uh, again, the same problem happened, uh, like with, with the TV screening here, when the athletes and the uh, hostage, hostage takers were to be transported to a different place, um, the, the, there were um, some, some uh, security people hiding, hoping that they maybe catch uh, um, some of the terrorists and they were, the terrorists could spot them. Yeah? So what happened is basically the, um, there were loads of negotiations taking place. This gentleman, rather remarkably, is called uh, Hans-Dietrich Genscher. He was the foreign secretary of Germany at the time. Offered himself, we know now, to be taken as a hostage in place of the Israelis. And he said, you, uh, I, I, he's, he's seen on camera one of the documentaries saying to Is this name, uh, his first name is Issa, who became known as the, the main spokesperson of, of the Palestinian uh, hostage takers um, said, you understand that Germany has a special responsibility towards Jewish people. Take me instead. Uh, but it wasn't going to happen. So what they negotiated in the end is that there was going to be an airplane on a small um, um, uh, airport at the outskirts of Germany, not the main airport, that the hostages were supposed to be transported there by helicopter, and uh, from there on, uh, the journey would go to uh, an Arab state, uh, presumably Libya, and, uh, and that was how the story was supposed to unfold. This is Andrei Spitzer. Uh, 
last time seen alive. Um, Andre Spitzer was a, a coach, uh, a fencing coach, and his widow, Anki Spitzer, is at the moment at the forefront, not at the moment, I should say, for the last 40 years, trying to make sure that people remember what has happened. And again, we're speaking today about remembrance, and I will get to that. So this is, I said, two died at the onset. I, I didn't want to shock you about this picture too much, but the, the significance of this image is another. We are having debates at the moment, and I don't think we'll get anywhere, that the building, number 31 Connolly Street, um, I'll show you, it will come up later, is, could be a potential memorial site. But at the moment, it is being used as a guest house, believe it or not, for the Max Planck Institute, which is a scientific research body. So if you're lucky enough and you're a science researcher, you could spend a night in this lovely room. And maybe the ghosts will visit you at night, I don't know. Um, so when they hit the airport, another German inad inadequacy. Because of their inability to provide sufficient security force, they're not knowing who really is responsible, they uh, provided normal police officers to do a shooting job uh, uh, and maybe free the hostages. But they mismanaged the count of the terrorists. They thought there were less and they found out, oh, there are eight, when they thought there was much less. They only had five manpower there. They used the wrong guns. It was failure to comply with the order because there was a police officer hiding in the airplane, ready to shoot, and he said, I'm not going to stay here, I don't want to lose my life, so he left. Um, there was bad lightning, there was bad information, lack of coordination, and the net experience, uh, a result of that is that um, the hostages, uh, after two, years, uh, two, two hours of a, of a battle, um, were shot by uh, two different um, hostage takers uh, and after they were shot they threw guns into the helicopters and, um, and that was basically it. And one German police officer uh, also died. Five of the hostage takers also were killed in the gun battle uh, but three survived. These are the uh, Israeli soldiers, uh, sorry, Israeli, uh, Israeli um, um, Olympians that found their dead. Um, so, Willy Daumer was the German uh, um, president of the organizing community, wanted to stop the games, and then they agreed they should continue. Um, that decision was um, agreed to by the Israeli Olympian team as well, because nobody wanted the Olympic Games to be taken hostage of. So they conti continued. So, um, predictably Israel retaliates. Uh, Germany sets up its first elite anti-terrorism uh, branch, um, but the hijacking of a German plane a few months later succeeds the release of all the terrorists. Um, and Israel's action um, against the uh, PLO, two key members from Munich survive. Um, and Abu Dawood, uh, who, who was one of the key stringers, said he had he regretted nothing. But perhaps it's also a difficult. He wrote a book, and he, that's where he says that. Perhaps it's also, uh, you know, he, he has a bit of a hero status. So I think I, I want to I want to say just a little point about the Palestinians because we talk about um, the eleven victims of the Israeli Olympic teams. In, in a larger sense, I see the uh, Palestinian hostage takers uh, also as a, an indirect victim because they were, and you know, we know now uh, in, in recent years how people get uh, brainwashed um, to commit terrible acts. And, uh, and, and although there's a full responsibility to, to terrorists for the acts that they commit, they are also victims. I always say that behind any one of those, even if it's not being culturally admitted, uh, I think you would be hard pressed to find somebody in, in, um, amongst Palestinians, although I know some people in the Peace Village, certainly there were people who would condemn those acts. But culturally on the public stage, I think um, the Palestinian terrorists are still seen 
more or less as, as heroes who promoted the Palestinian cause. But I, I'd say that behind each one of them is a mother and a father who mourn their, their deaths. And I think that in that sense, if we're talking about democracy and memorialization, there are more than 11 victims here. Because I think that the game, the, the game of, 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 of uh, living together is a different one. And it's not based on, uh, on, on cr creating cruelty. Right, so more important here, this is uh, the other aftermath. Um, the, there were two different attempts uh, by the uh, relatives of the Israeli uh, uh, families to uh, take the, the Munich authorities to court, and they didn't manage, but uh, by 2002, a compensation sum was paid, um, but due to very high legal costs, um, each uh, family only got about 40, 000, uh, 30 thousand pounds. In 1990, uh, almost after the uh, event, in the immediate aftermath of the event, um, a memorial stone was set in front of the building where it happened, where the hostages li uh, lived. And uh, but there was no proper memorial uh, stone as such, and uh, in the Olympic Park, and that was set up in 1995. In 2012, there was a memorial um, set up at the uh, airport, the old airport where something uh, where, the, where, where the hostages found their dead. And um, in 2013, a tourist information table um, was set up at the underground station. Um, now this is the memorial stone in front of 31 Connolly Street. Um, this is the building where things happen, and people go there and leave stones. But the, the, the problem, uh, stone, stone leaving is a, is a typical way of showing your, uh, your mourning and um, as an expression of, of you sharing the pain in, in Judaism. So that's why you see all these little stones. The problem with this, and this was there when I was young, is that it doesn't contextualize anything. And also, number 31 Connolly Street is right in the back of the village. It's very easy to omit this particular area. And my feeling was, when I grew up, that people sort of, yes, it happened, let's, let's, let's move on. Um, it's not an important thing. Whereas when you go outside of Munich, or if you speak to athletes and Olympians, this is, the, this is the one thing that people remember about the Olympics, you know, in 1972. Just like you remember about the 1968 Olympics, the fist. You know, or you might, if you, if you might remember that um, uh, the, the Moscow Olympics were boycotted and the Olympics afterwards were also boycotted and maybe uh, Sochi is known to be the Olympics where uh, LGBT rights were being discussed. Um, so in 1984, me being 15, I took a black paint uh, and I, you can just about see it, and I, I wrote on various spots in the village, don't forget, five, 5th of September 1972. Um, and I was displayed everywhere. And I would have been more, except one night um, I encountered um, um, a gentleman who took the pot of collar and put it over my head. And I remember shouting to him something and he shouted at me and, th and that was the temporary end. But I think that there was, there's an expression of me here as a Jewish, perhaps the only Jewish child in that village that, guys, I know there's a memorial stone here, yeah, but we're not talking about this. It's not present in our memory. We, we, don't, we don't engage with this. So if I thought that I'd tell you what, what it actually means to me. So I, I think that there's a pain of not being understood by the majority of others who live with me. There's a sense of displacement, especially as a migrant uh, or from, as a child of a migrant family. There's a feeling of lessons of the show are not being clear in a contemporary context. And there's a feeling that residents say about the value of democratic meaning is in disaccord with its democratic obligation uh, towards minorities um, in that sense. And a lack of voice and disempowerment, and hence I, I, I wrote what I wrote. Um, 
in, in my article, I, I say that the, um, the, memori the, the little um, tourist information board that is now in front of the underground station is perhaps an equivalent of what I wrote, because at least there is a little bit of contextualization in the village now. So, the, the citizens that bought the apartment in Munich are very strongly organized. Um, they have a very strong ten, um, um, community group that campaigns against many things. One of them was the, uh, the uh, football club by Munich wanted to set up a new stadium in the rear of the Olympic village and they said no. There was a magnetic high-speed railway link to be built and they said no. And then when it came in 2013, when it was suggested that a memorial site was going to be built, they said no. They didn't say, they say no, they didn't say quite no, but um, they, that they said no. So, this is what I'm talking about. Um, 2014 to 2015, dispute concerning location of memorial site in the Olympic Village. So, um, I'll, I'll just show you some more pictures quickly as we go through. This is the statue of 1995 in the Olympic Park. Again, no contextualization, they are just names. And it says that the 11 athletes were killed. Uh, this is at the, um, at the airport. This is at the airport. I have to say, and um, one of the um, surviving, uh, one of the um, relatives of, of the uh, killed athletes told me, this is very nice, but it's, if you know where the airport, it's very far out of the city. Nobody ever will go there. You know, you really have to seek out to go there. This is the tourist information board that I talked about. So, this is the memorial site proposal. It was put up to tender to different uh, architects and, and designers and they came up with this idea. It is supposed to, um, to memorize or remember the athletes were killed, but it's also to explain the context. There will be audio and visual um, uh, demonstrations, there will be all, all, the, con all the historical um, um, context will be explained and it's always open, you can go in and go out. This site is supposed to be erected on the hill that looked at number 31 Connolly Street where the Israeli athletes were uh, being kept and it's sort of the, where the spectacle of terror could be observed. Yeah? And so the, the artist thought um, it would be a good idea to cut the, the right at the top of the hill um, and the symbolism of it being to, because the, the terrorist act cut into the, um, into the Olympic events, so we'll cut into the, Olympic, into the hill of the Olympic site. Crucially, um, the IOC, I don't know if I say it here, yeah, it's, giving, it's covering one quarter of the cost and, I'll, and that is important for another reason and I need to go back for that. That is important because the Israeli uh, relatives have demanded that the IOC... <coughs> it's okay. The Israeli uh, relatives have demanded that the IOC, is the International Olympic Committee, remember um, the events, and that there should be a minute of silence. And here we've got a number of quotes which are very interesting. In 1976, the answer was, but it told us very clearly, there are about 21 Arab delegation that will leave if we say something about the Israeli athletes. So I said, let them leave if they can't understand that the Olympics are all about, a connection between people and through sport. And it goes on, and uh, in 2012, this came up again, I don't know if you remember, there was a, um, an argument about whether there should be a minute of silence and uh, Jacques um, Rogge, the then uh, president of the uh, Olympic Committee, uh, didn't do it, but he did it at a fringe meeting, a sort of, uh, um, I, I understand from Anke Spitzer that they felt that it was sort of doing the bare minimum of remembering it. 
At the same time, there was, uh, however, a, a, a French, another French meeting that uh, was put in honor of the Olympics. In my personal opinion, if you ask me, I, I think there's a lot of politi politics around the Olympics, and I think that it, if you can't get yourself to remember only the Israeli uh, athletes, what they should have is a minute of silence for all the political injustices of the Olympics. So the Jewish uh, non-admission in 1936, the killing of the Olympic athletes, the exclusion of gay and lesbian athletes um, from some sport events, the, the boycotts and all of that. We could literally, <coughs> at every Olympic opening, stand still for a minute to account for all of that. At the moment, it's not happening. Um, right, so let's go forward again. This is the first reason that was brought forward by the, by the residents of the Olympic Village. You can't have a memorial site here because this is the place where our children have snow fun. If you know the Olympic Village and the, and the, uh, and, and the Olympic Park, there must be about 20 hills. As to why that was something they would reject on these grounds, I don't understand. In my, in my personal um, email exchange, they now tell me it wasn't about that, but it was. They had collected um, signatures for that. Uh, you know, this is, our, this is our Snow Fun Hill. They now tell me it's because this is a green built space and they don't want to lose it. And also, then uh, was in, in response, the government decided, this is one of the emails to me, if you speak German, you can look at it. But in response, the, um, the um, government uh, of Bavaria suggested that the uh, site was to be built a little bit to the left on a different hill where there was no snow fun happening. And then the students came up and said, no, we don't want the hill there either because this is where we drink in the summer and have our summer parties. To me, this feels very hurtful because it's again, it's about not remembering what this village means to a significant minority or, what is, or the other meaning of the Olympic village. Now they have a third site um, under discussion, also on, on, on the edge of the hill, and they say, we, we might agree to that, but we want to have a say as to how, as, as to how exactly it looks. And he explains to me, here this is the director um, or the spokesperson of the Olympic Village uh, um, Residence Association, if you like. He says to me that uh, the Olympic Village is a, a symbol of democracy that should not be forgotten and we, were, we are not against memorialization but we weren't consulted properly and this is about the bills uh, and green environment etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's expressing it. I've, we had my newspaper one of the newspapers that works uh, that I work for sent independent of what I do sent an um, a journalist uh, to the Olympic Village to speak with this person and uh, she writes that he has a museum of the Olympics in his flat. So that's what he remembers. The orange color, the nice spills areas, but a certain, I'm, so, I'm sure there's no picture of the terrorist acts. Um, so, here are the reasons. I put them all up. Green space, 7 million euros spent on maintaining the Olympic Park per year. That's about 5 million pounds. Um, it's a very small area and there are many hills. <coughs> so I suggested in my pa paper that there's an old bus terminal which they could use. Um, I don't know if they're going to take that up or not. I thought this might be very interesting. Three pictures. I worked at the Olympics in London and it just shows you what ordinary people, the faces of, of athletes. You know, this is not, these are not the people you want to kill for whatever Israel may have done in the occupied territories or in Gaza. These are just swimmers and this guy, um, he, he won the gold medal in tennis and now we also have a Palestinian delegation. I, I thought it was important to show that as well, that we live now in a world where Palestine is acknowledged uh, in that sort of sense, Olympically. But this is not just rem remembering the Olympics, it's not just about 
Israel. And that's why we need a documentation center that properly explains that. This is about post-war Germany and democracy. What, why was the German state so unable to protect? It's about the embarrassment of the police, of showing police officers with guns, the federal structure of new Germany, need of protection of democracy, a very important lesson of, in terms of if you believe in, in pacifism, that's, that's nice and good, but you, th these games were very free and, and, and uh, a celebration of humanity, but yet they were very vulnerable. So, and, and I think that is important because when I worked in 2012 at the Olympics, I don't know if you remember, they had these um, uh, British army people on the rooftops. Do you remember that? And uh, there was a demonstration against that, uh, no arms at the Olympics to which I went. And I spoke to the demonstrators and asked them, well, do you not know what happened in 1972? And they looked at me and they didn't know what happened in 1972. And, uh, and so, so that again makes sense why it should be remembered at the Olympics. Because I think there is something crucial about the need of protection. I know that militarization can be going over the top, understand what the demonstrators wanted to say at the, 19, at the 2012 Olympics. But the bottom line is you need to protect all those people, the spectators, the athletes. Um, so, Jewish participation in the Olympic Games, another story, 1936, I already mentioned, how to resolve conflicts, um, and the show does not just go on, I wrote, because that's the word, the show must go on in 1972. So there is a continuation there. And there's more, this is about the Holocaust, this is about politics and the Olympic Games, anti-terror planning, memory, institutions, persuasion of young men, to engage in fatal and inhuman missions against civilians. So I really already touched about this a little bit. This is also about the Palestinians who got themselves caught up to, to be agents of, of, of terrorism. And, and I think if we, talk, if we want a memorial that remembers democracy, which is what the, the residents of the Olympic Village tell me, then we need to talk about also that. Yeah? So the current situation is, third hill position discussed, um, former bus terminal question open, the building 31 Connolly Street is not <coughs> discussed, um, apparently residents insist they are not against a site, and the city council of Munich said that the residents are like Pegida demonstrators, Pegida is a movement in Germany that is very anti-Jewish, uh, anti-Muslim, and say that, um, probably not so anti-Jewish as it is anti-Muslim, and he compared the residents to that. I brought this slide as well. It's nothing to do with Munich. This is Czechochin, where my father was born. Um, we went to visit the village, uh, or the small town, and there was almost no remembrance of the Jewish people there. Um, what you can see here is um, the leftover gravestones of a ground that was cleared. Uh, to build a mansion for a, a former rich uh, communist uh, uh, um, statesman. And um, when the Jewish uh, um, uh, families of survivors and some few survivors that were still alive came uh, and started to talk with people, they said, well, we want you to at least honor some remembrance there. And there was very great hostility to that. Um, when I personally visited it, they erected a, a little um, acrylic glass um, um, sign <coughs> that said that in this town one of the most famous rabbis of Czechochin was born. It was, it was um, um, erected on the day I came. On the day after, it was torn down. Yeah. And I've written, <coughs> it was 20 hours, I've written a story, uh, 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 it's on open democracy, you can look it up, I've written a whole, a whole thing about democracy and neighbors and how to be a good neighbor. And because obviously these people are the former neighbors of my father's family. And I said, you need to have a memorial to the, to the lost Jews. Um, and uh, astonishing for them, they had a debate amongst themselves and after two years they built that, made out of the leftover gravestones. So, so I think that, that memory and negotiation happens uh, and there's a negotiation of that. And I think, I argued uh, in my paper on that, 
that you don't remember for us. Yes, we want the victims to be remembered because we have a personal interest, but you remember that for yourself. When I was in Czechoslovakia, I asked them, who are your minorities now? They said, Roma, Gypsies, and people from the Ukraine. I said, these are the people that the lesson of that need to apply to, not us. We're not there anymore. And I think that when, it, when you talk about um, the Olympics um, and this memorial, this is certainly not, you know, I have an interest in there because my mother still lives there, but this is, this is a lesson to Germans or for anyone who wishes to hear it. This is a lesson about, about democracy, about the Olympic Games, about the fallibility of, of, of celebrations. That is what it is really about. Um, and I added also what it can be about, is you can make, you can set up a foundation that brings people from conflict zones together and engage in meaningful sport activities and conversations or make something good out of it, you know, create life. I think that is very important. And the reason why I know that is that you mentioned you wanted me to uh, reference the Palestinian uh, Israeli peace village. There was a soldier that came from this village that um, perished in an, in an, uh, um, in an accident. Um, I, think, I think a helicopter fell down and he was in that helicopter. And they brought the body back and it is, it is tradition in Israel to, um, to give, when a soldier dies, you get a proper state funeral and, and you know, it's, uh, it's very mi militaristic. And the village, because it's half Palestinian, wouldn't have it. The Palestinians said, we will not have a military funeral in the village. So what happened is, I didn't bring a picture of that, they, they opened a basketball ground in honor of that uh, lost son of the village and it became something living, something engaging um, that, that people could, could work with. Um, and I, I think that's the end of my talk, I think I've spoken far too much. If you have a burning question, please uh, let it be known now. <laughs> yeah. Why is there this, do you think, that it's only recently that there is this concrete proposal for the new memorial? Why is it happening recently and not I think 15 with, years ago? I think that's a very good question and I think that, that I thought about it and I think also with, to, go, to do with uh, the Polish village. I think memory requires a certain distance uh, to the event. Um, practical distance because the people in authority need to be gone because the people that are in authority might have a vested interest in the not knowing, not sharing uh, uh, the wrongdoing. Uh, and also because uh, a historical perspective, you as a historian, gives you uh, greater insights as to the context and meanings of what actually happened. I know, for example, that the uh, surviving, uh, as always say, surviving, the, the relatives of the um, uh, of the victims have now got a commission in, in uh, Berlin uh, looking at all the documents from, from those days, government documents, which Ang Angela Merkel, to her credit, the uh, uh, Chancellor of Germany, made available. And so um, the, 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 the length is to do with guilt, is to do with practicalities, with authority, and a sort of natural process, I think. I think Probably it can't happen immediately afterwards unless circumstances are extremely clear. You mentioned about um, negotiation. You used the term memory and negotiation as being integral to this process. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that because it seems to me as if memorialization includes that negotiation. It's not just the finished product, whether that's a a building or a stone, it seems as if it's actually the, the uh, communications, the correspondence, the activism, all of that together. Yeah, I think, I think in, in, in the 1972 case, if uh, Anki Spitzer and Ilana Romanov, uh, who are both uh, widows, um, wouldn't have campaigned intensely and made sure that this is not forgotten, that this would have been gotten forgotten. And not to say that the, 
you know, every year there, there was uh, some a bouquet of flowers being laid in front of 31 Connolly Street, and th this did happen. But um, to make this accessible to the greater majority uh, required a lot of activism, and it's a lot. It's a huge burden on the on the uh, on the mourners. Uh, I think uh, to to have to go out and say, look, you have you don't remember us. What are you going to do? Um, Again, I think in the most noble uh, hum human examples, perhaps that shouldn't happen, but uh, I think reality tells us that this is required. So it's a real cost to people like yourself and some of these other families, and that's still ongoing. I, I, I think that my cost is definitely not as high as that of somebody like Anki Spitzer, who has lost, you know, she, she lost the life that she had planned. Um, and, 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 and so did the... Uh, uh, her daughter, I think, who was only five months uh, or five weeks old even at the time. Um, so I, I think there's a very deep personal cost and, and she's, she's not going to let it to be forgotten. And I, and I understand, for example, from her that she, in spite of that, being very tolerant and, and open to hear and see it happening, but it's not happening fast enough, perhaps. Yeah. Yes, sorry, I have another question. For me, it's the elephant in the room, which is Paris and the Jewish supermarkets. Yeah. And for me, it seems that in Munich 72, what happened for the German state, it was something to be forgotten because of all of the incompetence that fed into it being such a disaster. Whereas for the French state at the moment, the fact that there were Jewish victims in Paris feeds into all sorts of agendas that we can see in terms of a take on um, what they see as, what they describe as Islamism and the existential threat of Europe and the West. And it seems very convenient for Francois Hollande and, me, and many others. And all those people who gathered in that fake photo when they all came all the world leaders to be Charlie, and then Private Eye showed, and it was circulated on social media that actually they weren't joining in the march, it was just completely staged. But I wonder, from your point of view, whether you see any connections at all, or, or, it, or, or just what your thoughts are I'll comparing tell you, the two things. My, my thoughts about this, and this stems perhaps from some of the research I've done when I was at, uh, uh, trying to do a, a res research on militant violence, with 72 and democracy, and perhaps also with Charlie Hebdo, you have to understand that those of you who have studied political theory will know that guerrilla warfare and, uh, and uh, the, the, the writings of uh, Mao and uh, um, Fanon and um, you know, the, uh, the understanding of the, 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 the Viet Cong belonged to those who like to resist. So if we if we want to have a full sense of understanding of how movements and resistance work, we have to deal with the political theories and theorists that have advocated that uh, uh, you go into the civilian uh, population, create something spectacular, and therefore will draw attention towards you. I think if I can see a parallel, it's, it's in that, that theory um, is, is, is both, which is obviously t theory of ter terror, is, is the same in both cases. And then on, on top of that go certain theories about, uh, in both cases, about Jews, uh, perhaps, although I think that for the Black September movement, um, it, it was, I, it, I mean, you know, I, don't, I can't talk for them, but I would, I would imagine that they saw the issue more about uh, um, the um, displacement from, from the lands that they saw themselves and they wanted to do something so that their cause is on the map. Uh, whether, whether it was wise to go to the greatest, what is described as the greatest uh, festival, uh, spectacular on, on earth and, and take innocent civilians, um, you know, obviously that was not a good idea. Um, but 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 young people are often they want they want to do something and they're often uh, 
um, very sub, uh, you know, they're very open to those ideas. You know, all you need to do is go to a big spectacle, throw your gun, and the world will change. And we all know that it doesn't change. You know, it, it just creates pain. Um, and in the end, it will be negotiations and talks uh, that, that move us forward. You're aware of the film, the, the film that came out, I'm not sure exactly what year it was out now. It's called Munich, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's called Munich, or I think in some places it's called the, um, um, called the One Day in September, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, Does that have a function at all? Do you think that has any positive function? I think the movie is uh, it, it's just one of the reflections on it. it, it, it's, it's, it there were many movies about it, and there were, you know, the Israelis made their own movie from their own perspective, and you know, I think the the the, the, the uh, one day in September attempts to show that um, it, it parallels the actions of the of the Black September people with the actions of the Mossad trying to hunt down the perpetrators. Um, I I. I it's all, it's both a, 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 they're different worlds, I think, and I don't, I think they belong together and they don't belong together. Um, but I, I think in, it's in the sense that what I said, that you can very clearly see that, that the uh, Olympians were innocent victims, but as, as I said, in, in some sense, you have to always remember that behind every terrorist, and this is from my other research, there is a human being that, somehow got to this point to commit these terrible acts. And, and if we want, and the residents of the Olympic Village, their reason for opposing the memorial site or wanting it in a different place is they'd say, well, this is a place of democracy, the greatest, memori the greatest architecture, uh, built architecture for, for, for democracy. If they're really true to what they say, then, then we need to understand all the parts of democracy. And, uh, and that includes understanding that uh, democratic civil society is, is vulnerable to terrorist attacks, and that terrorism is an ideology that, is, um, that, that, that uh, belongs to uh, inability to express yourself in a, in a different way, uh, which again, means that we, we need to make sure that, that the voices of uh, the small people are being heard. And I think in, 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 uh, on the memorialization, in, in the Olympic Village, I'm the only, I think we, as far as I know, we're the only Jewish family that lived there. And it, it doesn't, we don't have a voice in it. You know, 500 residents saying, no, we don't want that memorial at this site. How can you oppose that? But um, I think when you have minorities, you have to take that serious. Um, and you can't just go on and pretend that you you know, because your interests are served, um, whatever other people say has no, has, has, has no meaning. Uh, like you say, um, it's, it's within the nego nego negotiated space. And that includes negotiation amongst all people, and uh, negotiation amongst Germans, um, the, the Jewish interest parties have to talk to each other. When I was in the peace village, it, it, it's negotiation on all different levels. It's not just Palestinians and Jews that make peace. It's Jews talking amongst themselves. It's Palestinians talking amongst themselves. You know, and, and so that is democracy. We talk. <laughs> and on that note, um, I think it's suitable for us to say thank you to Daniel for his visit to Edgefield. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you very much.